I want to welcome you to today's webinar as usually hosted by the Open Telecom Cloud community. Today we have a guest from the product management team of the Open Telecom Cloud with us. It's Christian Bölle. Christian is the product manager, for example, of the API gateway. He also has some more services, but today he will give us his information about the API gateway, about the dedicated API gateway. With this, I will lead over to you, Christian, and thank you for having you here. Let's have a nice webinar all together. Thank you. All right, great, Stefan. Thanks for the introduction. Also, a warm welcome from my side. So today in this webinar, we want to talk about our API gateway. This is a new service available on the Open Telecom Cloud. And I want to give you some insights. What, what is in for you? What functionalities we, we offer with this service and how we can use it. And we will also see it in action later on. Okay, let's start into it. The Open API Gateway has a couple of key functionalities, which I have listed down here. So, for example, one of the most important thing is the overall lifecycle management of APIs. So, APIs are nowadays, I would say, the de facto standard, how backend services are communicating each other or the clients are connecting to the backend services, let it be mobile applications or classical browser applications. So APIs are important for all of us. That's why that lifecycle management is pretty important. So it also supports version management that different versions can be, can be deployed. Maybe a version need to be rolled back. All these kinds of activities are possible with our API gateway. Next to that, we can have multiple environments for APIs. We can define requests for the link and also access and authentications for all these APIs. Then there are some other tools which are pretty important when we want to deploy APIs, like a debugging tool, the monitoring, and also very important, the VPC channels, how we connect our backend systems which are running on the Open Telecom Cloud. So let's have a more detailed look into the architecture of the API Gateway. So when you activate the API Gateway, on the Open Telecom Cloud, you will get a dedicated gateway, which is only active in your uh, tenant. Means you don't have to share your API gateway with any other um, uh, tenant, which is running on the Open Telecom Cloud. So it brings a couple of functionalities. You can connect it directly to the internet, either with a full qualified domain name, with a SSL certificate. As usual, you can even use the web application firewall, uh, securing your APIs, then our API gateway is also connected to, to the CS, to the Cloud I monitoring service, as well as even the logging functionalities available. Now here on the, on the other side, we have the VPC channels, and these VPC channels, they are pretty important to connect your backend systems. Because the API at the end has to be forwarded to a server which can fulfill the API request. That can be multiple VPCs which you can connect, as well as you can connect it to your CCE cluster. We will see this later on also in the demonstration. So now let's look into four functionalities in a little bit more detail. The first is the API environments. What are environments? So every API can have multiple environments. So, so what does it mean? An environment for API has a couple of um, functionalities, what you can connect, like you can define variables for an environment, um, either for the API itself or for the backend. You can define sorting policies, access policies, and the authentications. Now, what is the advantage of these environments? Environments can be used to have the same API handled in a different way. I can give you maybe an example. Uh, you have one API which can serve uh, uh, encrypted backend, one has maybe an unencrypted backend. So you can control the success with your environment. Other examples could be that you have an API which is available in, a, in the release version, as well as maybe in a staging or in a development version, which gives them more information about the, the API. This we'll see also later on. But if you decide to not use different environments for API, that's also fine. 
one default environment is also good enough. Then let's look into the authentication. Today, our API gateway supports three major types of authentications. One is the so-called app control, which, which means that we define a secret key, we inform the caller of this API which secret to be used, and that secret then has to be added in order requests. So you can ensure no unknown user of your API can call your API. There are two ways of it, a simple token, that means that you have just one key, or you can even define a so-called AKSK, pair means an access key and a secret key. So you can define multiple applications and every application has one access key and then multiple secret keys can be added to this application. That's a useful functionality. Then you can group your secret keys in different applications. The second is the EM authentication. EM is, uh, I would say, nowadays the standard authentication for all the OTC APIs. And this is also available with a, either with a bearer token, means like a temporary access token, or also with a AKSK pair, which will be then an access key and a secret key. Next to that, you can also implement custom authenticators used for the front end and for the back ends. But that will be maybe another session how to implement that. And also what is also possible clearly is to say, okay, we don't want authentication, we open public APIs to the internet. The next item we want, I want to shortly describe is the request throttling policy. This is, I would say, a very important thing because every API should have a request throttling policy because we have to define the limits of our APIs, how many requests will be served from our API. A request throttling policy in our gateway can be defined for each API, uh, like you see, like you can see here, and it can be defined in the total number of requests, like 5,000 times in a second uh, API can be called, or I can also say that from these 5,000 times, the 10 applications running into it, every application maybe gets a share of this throttling policy of, for example, 500. So I can then separate the applications and the users and even the IP address from each other. And every throttling policy can be defined in seconds, minutes, or hours and days. Next to that, not only a single API can be defined as a request throttling policy, we can also define policies for a group of APIs. Sometimes it's required that you, you have multiple APIs belonging to the same use case, for example, and these APIs then can be grouped into one policy and say, okay, this set of APIs, like these three APIs, are under the same request throttling policy. We will see that later on also in the demonstration. Now, next to that, this is a little bit more. This is the so-called VPC channels. The VPC channels in the API gateway define how the API access your backend systems. Today, we support four types of these VPC channel configurations, and they act more or less in a similar way like a load balancer. The, the first one, the WRR, the weighted round robin, means that there is an equal distribution of all incoming requests for all your connected backend nodes. You can see an example, you can define a weightage, and with this weightage, you can steer how many percent of the requests which are incoming are routed to which node. In this example, you have 80% on the node, first node and 10% on the second and 10% on the third. You can also define this in equal distribution, like 33% here, 33% here, 33% here. You can define this yourself. The next is the so-called WLC, the weighted least connection is that you can define that all active connections should be equally distributed on your cluster nodes. Means the the node which currently handles the least connection also will get the next incoming request the most until it has reached an equal share of the active connections. The third is the source hashing, means every IP address which sends the same requests will end up on the same node. You can see that every request which is sent from the same sender lands up on this node 
this this sender will send will all the requests will end up on this node. And the same then also can be done with the URI or with the URL more or less. This is useful sometimes when you operate a website uh, which requires that the caching is happening on the same node than before. So you see the same incoming URLs are always served from the same node in the cluster. So these are the four available options. To be honest, we will look into demo into this one here, the weighted one Robin will see later on. Okay, these are the functionalities we, we want to uh, demonstrate today in this webinar. So I think it's maybe time to, to look into how this product really operates on our cloud infrastructure. So I have logged in into the Open Telecom Cloud. And what you can see here is I have configured already an API gateway, which is working in my tenant. And this API gateway is already pre-configured because it takes a couple of minutes to, to, to start it. So this is why I use a pre-configured one. This is connected to the internet um, and it has no API yet uh, deployed. We will do this together now. And in this, this API, I have defined um, API group for this for the demo today. And what we will do, we will create together an API. But when we want to create the API, the first thing is typically what we have to do is we have to define what is this API supposed to do? So what is the functionality we want to serve? I've created here a little API, which is a sample API, which we want to use today. This API um, can have or has two functionalities. We can read out from um, information about our data centers and connected to the Open Telecom Cloud. And with these information, we can see how the API can work. And the other API we, we define today is that we will send like a feedback to the backend system, which allows us to, for example, define a text with a rating how we like the, the API demo today. So these two functionalities we want to activate today from our backend. Let's get started. So we create a new API in our system, we give a nice name. Demo. Then we use all the default gateway responses, which are available in our, in our gateway. We will see this also later on. Then we will define the security authentication mechanism for our API. And in our case, we really want to use this, this app one, which I mentioned before means we will need later on a secret key to define uh, to access our APIs. Then let's have a nice uh, option. Let's go to the next part. The next part means now I have to define for my API gateway for under which endpoint or which path this API should be published. And I can use this here from the example. This means that we want to have all APIs coming with this request routed for this API. And now here we can define that everything behind this URL, as if someone adds now here a slash and adds maybe more information, we want to route everything. Uh, which comes in under this URL to this API. And we not only want to support a GET method, we want to support all methods um, to our backend. Means HTTP methods, which could be GET, POST, PUT, anything available. We activate course today for our demo that we can also use it from outside the web server as well as from HX request. Now we will look here into the backend configuration. What we will do is we, we can use HTTP in the backend. Um, that's, that's okay. And the VPC demo plane, this is also pre-configured. We will see this later on, we will use. And we also have now to define the path, how our backend system, the URL, has to react on our API. So in this case, we will use uh, 
we will use this URL. This is pre-configured in our backend system. We define a timeout, and then actually we are nearly ready to go. The samples we don't define today, and then we are there. So now we have defined for our demo today three environments, which could be, which is a release environment, a staging environment, and a development environment. So the first thing is what we have to do now is the API which we have just created, we have to publish it. With this publish API, I can now define, okay, in which environment this API needs to be published. In our case, this is this is the first one, it's the release one. And as you remember, in the beginning, I have explained that every environment stands on its own. It means every environment can have its own API specification means I have to now publish this API also in all the other environments because we have created it completely newly. So we also have to publish it in staging as well as we have to publish it in the development environment. So what I have done now, I have actually activated the API. I have informed the API gateway which URL um, it should be served, how to forward it to the backend, with what URL and which environment should be supported. Okay, so the next thing is now what I want to do is I want to say, hmm, I don't want to, I want to use authentication for my, for my API. This I can do here with authentication. And now I want to select the application. This application we, we activate now for all the three environments. So. What does this mean? Let's shortly look into this application. We have defined in our API gateway here the application code, which is this one here, the demo CG1. And this application has an associated secret key. Um, I'm just going to show that shortly. And this secret key you have to give to all the, the, the callers of this API to be able to use it. it. Means if you don't know this secret, you cannot use the API. Okay, now let's go back to our API. And we have defined now uh, the authentication and activated it for all the three stages. That's perfectly fine. Now the next thing is, as I mentioned, that every API should have a request forwarding policy. So we will also do this together now. A request forwarding policy can be activated one policy for all the three environments which we just created, or we can define it in a way that we give different throttling policies on different requirements. So let's do that. So for our environment, which is which is released, which is the main environment, allowing all the participant to use the released stable version of our API, I activate the throttling policy, which is quite uh, which allows a lot of requests. So this I can do here. And then to the other APIs, like the staging, I give a request throttling policy, which is much more limiting the requests to avoid that uh, too many people calling their development environment, for example. Now what I've done now, I have assigned three throttling policies to each environment. We can shortly have a look what throttling policies I've so far configured. What you can see here, this is the main one for the release environment. This defines that every hour in total 6,000 calls can be served and every application can have a share of 2,000 calls. In this in this way, when you define a request throttling policy, this is how it looks. You can define these parameters, which we also have seen before in the PowerPoint. So here you define what is the period, what, what you want to specify. In this case, we set hour per hour. We, we give 2,000 requests per hour this API. And the, to limit the access to the development environment, what we have done here now is we say, Oh, we don't want to have 2,000 requests per hour. We said we want to limit it 
this is not for demo purposes, to five chords per minute. This is just to ensure that our development servers and staging servers are not overloaded. Good. Now let's go back to our API and see what else what we have to configure. We have the API available. We have the authenticators available. We have the request following policies available. Actually, that's it. Means we should be able to, to, to call this API. So what we can do now here, the API gateway has a very nice functionality to allow you to say, okay, I want to test this API. I can go into the debug mode and say, okay, let's try if this API is working. This is actually an internal call of the API gateway to test if our backend system is working. So now what we can do is we can look how our API is specified and it says, ah, okay, here the, this is the path. We want DC info. Let's check if it's working. I enter this here and the request and say, oh, perfect. That means this API can forward this request as a GET request into this into this path into the backend and the backend is, is answering perfectly fine. So now we we are sure that our API is working. It's working internally, and what we now have to do is we have to configure in our API gateway a public endpoint, which involves then a URL, a DNS setting, as well as the SSI certificates. And to be honest, I have done that already because it takes a little bit of time and I don't want to make it too boring. So this group where when I created this API is also bound to a public domain. And this public domain we will now we will now call. And for that we have a little tool creator. This uh, this tool you can uh, you can see here. This is this is um, um, a page actually accesses our API, which we have just activated. So let's do a test. Let's go to the release environment and call our API and see what's happening. So, perfectly fine. It's working. So what this API is doing is actually showing us for all the locations of the Open Telecom Cloud, what is the weather. So we see here in Switzerland for our two data centers, they have a clear sky. In Germany, uh, overcast clouds, and in Netherlands, a couple of few clouds. What we have here now is also the temperature offered by this API. And what you can see here on that on this panel is we have done a success request to the API. It, it got answered. And what you see here now, this is in the debug mode available, is you can see our request for the link policies. If you remember, I said this API can have 2,000 calls per hour. So what I do now is if I call this API multiple times, you can see how the counter of the remaining API calls per, per hour are decreasing. So if I reach the end of this counter, actually get my, my maximum API requests per throttling policy has been reached, and I will be not able anymore to call this API. And what you see here in this demo is here we defined our app code to access the API and that secret, which I just showed you on the console before. If I change the secret and use an illegal um, or a wrong secret, you can see what happens. The API gateway is not allowing me to access these weather informations from our data center because I'm using the wrong secret. And this is a error response, which is automatically generating uh, generated from the API gateway it does not even reach our backend system in this case. You get a 401 authentic uh, authentication error. So, cool, perfectly fine. When we use the right key uh, or the, the, the correct secret, we, are, we, are, we can allow, we get that API back. So now, what is happening when I, when I, what can I do with this API? For example, I can do a filter. I say, okay, I'm only interested in, the locations in Germany, so the API is getting this query and filters the API response according to my input, as well as I can, for example, 
um, show uh, the geodata, which means the longitude and the latitude of our locations. So we have now seen how we use the API, how we can send parameters, how the backend can react on it. But now the interesting part of it is what will happen if I change the environment. So let's go to the staging environment. So the first thing is what is happening is that you can see the backend is reacting on the different environments and includes now the request ID, for example in the staging. For staging use cases, sometimes it's it's nice to know the request ID from the backend that we can use a, a testing uh, for end-to-end. -end. Or when we switch to the development environment, even more information is included that this is a debug mode and the backend used about 8 milliseconds to process this request. So you can see that from the front end, this is passed through the API gateway and we can and the backend can react on different stages. You can also include, for example, routing policies that we say that a development API request is handled maybe even from a different URL, from a different server, maybe with a newer version of, the, of your API, all these kind of things are also possible. In our case now, we just uh, react on this kind of response codes. Now, the interesting part is, if you remember, we defined that you can only call this development API five times per minute. And as you can see, I called it already one time. So let's call it five times. So now, so far, so good. Now let's call it one more time. And what is happening now here is I have actually reached the throttling policy. Means the API gateway is not allowing me to access this API anymore unless the next minute. Uh, comes. And what you can see here now is I have defined here a customized response from our API gateway. The first three are the, the first three informations here. These are the default, what the API gateway is telling. And then I said, okay, if your API call is running into this throttling policy, then you can say, okay, you can give specific messages. Please log into the portal, check your current plan and upgrade options. And you can even define a link. So how I've done that, in the API gateway itself, every API group has specific response parameters, which you can customize to your need. Let's look here, request throttle policy. You can see here I've defined, I've extended the default message in a way to include these two more parameters, the message and the URL for your users. This you can do for all the templates, which our API gateway brings by default, and you can customize it where you need. Okay, let's go back to our to our API. Now we have um, we have seen the rate limits, how to query it, and now the interesting part would be, okay, what or how a backend um, error can can look like. Now. The, this API supports actually two parameters, which are show and hide for the geodata. Now I have to go back to my release environment. And if I use here any wrong value in this, then we will see a response code 500. 500 means this is not from the API gateway. This is now an error message from our backend system informing the user that he has used maybe something wrong in this case. So now we have seen response codes and error codes from the gateway and even from the backend system. Now, how we maybe, as of, so far we have only read informations. Now let's go to the next example, which I've showed before, that we can send some information. Now our, our API can accept um, a feedback, which we said, which, which is a text as well as a rating. So let's let's use this API. Now we can say great. So we give it four stars. We use again our release environment. And now let's send this, this information to the server. As you can see, response is pretty, pretty simple. Feedback accepted. So the backend system has now received 
um, the information which you have typed in here. That's perfectly fine. We can also produce a backend error. In this case, now for demo purposes, we can add a noob to the request. And whenever a noob is sent in the input, then the backend system is reacting with a customized error response, which you can see here. So every 500, you can see this is not allowed. Now, the next thing is, we also can protect our APIs with our WAF. The WAF is our web application firewall, which is offered from the Open Telecom Cloud. And as you can see, the info in this API, we just, we just have called the API gateway, we forwarded it via the VPC channel to our backend system. Now here, the WAF is in between. It's actually in front of the API gateway. So what happens now is when we call this API, it will be protected from our web application firewall. For example, I can give you here now one. What I'm trying to do now is to perform an SQL injection because we maybe believe that there is a database running um, at the backend which is accepting our feedbacks and storing it. So what I try to do now is I try to inject it and what happens is that I get a 418. A 418 is a response that the web application firewall has not allowed you to call the API gateway. So it was even blocked before the API gateway even got here. And the API gateway also then definitely has not forwarded to the backend. So we have secured our APIs with the web application firewall. This is useful, I think, if you have APIs which are only used from backend to backend, then it's maybe not not uh, very useful, but in case your APIs are exposed into the browser or into mobile applications for, to, to all the clients, then it's, I think, uh, it's a valid use case to, to consider to secure your APIs. Now, the third thing is, what we want to look at it is about the, the backend configuration. So what we have prepared here is a little page which shows um, and we can uh, do a try run of our backend, backend configuration. What you can see here now is we have actually configured two backend servers behind our uh, API gateway, which is called BCP1 and BCP2. So both of them are actually handling more or less our requests in an equal manner, means 50-50, as you can see here. And this test, we can do a test with around about 100 requests which are fired from the public endpoint into the API gateway, and it's using the heartbeat of our control plane. And this control plane responds with which server is responding, which version the server runs, and in how many milliseconds the, the heartbeat got responded. So far, so good. So we have a load balancing algorithm, the WRR, the weighted round robbing configured in our backend. So let's have a short look into it. So this, I can see here under our VPC channels. We have one VPC channel activated for our demo plane. And in the demo plane, you see currently these two ECS servers running. And you can see the weightage, which we have also defined. More or less, the weightage is equal, means the, the response, also every server gets, the, gets a similar load. So now what is happening and what we do also a lot is maybe we have a new backend version coming up and this new backend version we want to activate in our, in our cluster. So what we can do is I can now add the BCP3 into the system, which is a third backend system. And what I do now here is I give this a weightage of around about percent. So because we are not sure if the new version is doing really as good as it should do, maybe we want to not risk the entire performance of our APIs. So what we will do is we will keep the other two handling 98% of the load and the new version we, we bring in as, as a soft launch and we will see how it works. So what we can do now is we rerun our backend inspection and what you can see is the third server got activated, the BCP3. It brings in a new version of the backend system, 1.1, and it's more or less uh, now handling 4% of the incoming requests. 
So what is happening is that with this little tool, we are really firing 100 requests. We can also, uh, for example, fire 150 requests. Let's see. Ah, yes. 150 requests. These 150 requests, you can see it, it's, uh, again, the three requests got handled from the new version, which were which is around 2%, two, two and the other took the other version. So now the good thing is we can monitor this for two, three days. We can see how everything is working. And if we are fine, we can say, okay, let's give every every uh, backend node again the same weightage. So what we will see now is that all the three nodes hopefully are doing as you can see, yes, now they're equally distributed, everyone handling more or less the same node. Or what you also what also happens is maybe the new version is not behaving as expected, and I want to disable it. Then I just deactivate the server, we run the audit, and you can see we are back to two servers who are handling equally the share um, of the load. So this is a quite useful functionality, I would say, when you bring in the new versions maybe of your backend planes and you can you can see how you can configure them okay pretty pretty good so now what i wanted to uh, show you is two little additional topics which are available for our apis so as you can see here all the demo requests which I fired now into this API, you can see here. We have produced a couple of um, errors. We have called it successfully, so you can monitor your APIs. In the cloud monitoring system, you can even see more requests um, and metrics to monitor your APIs. You see the throughput, the latency. You see the number of errors and the number of, number of requests for this API. And I really recommend you, this is the best practice, I would say, to uh, to monitor all of these APIs to see if your backend systems are behaving in the same time, are they getting slower, do you have the number of requests uh, or the number of errors are increasing and all these kind of things. It's, it's a best practice as well as on the instance level, every API gateway also offers you a metric to monitor your throttled requests. So how many requests are throttled? Because every time you throttle a request, your client is not able to call your API, which is sometimes intended because that's why you throttle the request. On the other side, sometimes um, it's not intended and you want to react. Maybe you want to increase the throttling policy. Maybe you want to increase the backend capacities, all these kind of things. These are very important KPIs to monitor, I would say. And the next, item what the API gateway offers to you. This is the access log, and this is nicely integrated to our LTS service from the platform. So you can really trace and see all the requests which are incoming. So you can really see these are the live requests we just performed into demonstration, and you can see what API, uh, what app code um, has accessed when this, this API with what URL. Okay, this is it so far to the API gateway. I think what we have uh, what we have seen um, is, is interesting. And this demo page, which I have just used, by the way, you can also ex uh, you can also use it yourself. With this link here, so you can, if you want, you can try it out yourself. Good. Next to this. What is the API gateway? What additions do we today offer? When you activate it yourself, you will see that there are four additions what we offer today. So the first edition is limited to maximum of 2,000 transactions per second, which more or less makes it uh, to 5 billion requests per month. So it has a lot of capacity, I would say, uh, to start. And the prices you can see for per compute hour in Germany, as well as in the Netherlands. Netherlands is not yet activated, 
so only in Germany. You see four editions, and these four editions you, you can use already today. Perfectly fine. So now, what's next? What's next is that they are, we are working on two guidelines, uh, which, we, uh, which we want to publish soon in our uh, community. One is about the WAF, how to activate the WAF in, on top of it. So by the way, you can use the shared WAF as well as the dedicated WAF to protect your APIs, if you want to do that. The second is the OO2, which we are working on with a so-called custom authenticator to support the, the OO2 standards for for API authentication. So now we have seen how we can activate the API using ECS system, how we use CCE clusters to respond to an API request. But now there's something new available. This is so-called functions. With functions, you can also respond to an API uh, request. And these functions, what you see here now, this is a sneak preview. This is actually similar like cloud functions. So I've prepared, prepared here now one function, which is available, uh, which, which is accessing the same, like our API demo, it's accessing the, the, our DCI server, the cache, which holding the weather information about our locations. It is scanning the cache for exactly our locations, and it's returning the data which we store in the cache. So what we can do here now, we can also test this function. It's working perfectly fine. And this is now, this I can map into the API gateway. How can I do that? I can define a trigger for exactly this function which I defined here now. And this function allows me to define a trigger in the API gateway. There are also other triggers available, but today we want to do it in the API gateway. We define uh, together a function. Uh, we, we define a name for the API. Let's call it uh, function demo. We publish it into the same API group, which we have configured before. We also publish it into the release version. So there's no development version for this function available. And for now, we say we don't want any authentication. That means uh, let's let's see what's happening. So mean we have here now a trigger created for exactly this function. And when I go back to my API gateway, I should see in this group here an API which is created right now. And this API, let's see what what it can do. Let's call it on the browser. And as you can see, it has returned all the better information stored in our cache, also for the six, six locations of the Open Telecom Cloud. So what you can even see that the cache is already have, um, storing also the wind information, which the, the backend system is not yet sending out. So perfectly fine. So what is next here? This is the information I wanted to show you functions will be available on OTC. It is integrated with the API gateway. You don't have to use the API gateway to use functions, but it's a great uh, way to, to call functions from, from outside. Other triggers for function graph can be OBS, the data injection service, or maybe the messaging services, what we offer on OTC. And the really good news is the API gateway basic and the functions are available free of charge in April and May. So this month and next month, so you can really start using it. You can define functions yourself. You can also use functions for Java, C Sharp, like in my example, which I showed it was Node.js. And you're very invited to use our new functionality on OTC. So that was it from, for me today. Um, I hope it was informative and you got some good idea how you can publish APIs with our gateway, how you can configure your backend access to it, and yeah, what we are working on next. All right. Thank you a lot, Christian, for this great presentation today. 
it was very, very nice. And I think we all got a great overview and introduction into the service. So thank you a lot for having you here. For sure, we also have some questions in the chat. So I will pick a few out of them. Can the number of the requests be auto-scaled? So this is connected to the limitations which you have shown, where you mm -hmm. have said this, this amount of requests is allowed in a minute, in an hour, for example. Can this be also connected to auto-scaling logic? Yes. The request throttles, what you can define and the policies are all available in the APIs of the API gateway means you can automate all this, this uh, what I have configured today in the console. This is important when you want to create, for example, keys. You maybe have 500 applications with 500 secret keys for different APIs. You can use the API itself to create them. You can scale the policies as well as you can configure the API access parameters for it. You can all automate that, yes. All right, thank you for this answer. Next question would be, how do we deal with the situation when APIs are not exactly behaving like they are supposed to do? So are there any recommendations for this situation? I think this was also already a little bit targeted with the lock tank and uh, monitoring, etc. But maybe you can spend some words into this direction. Yeah, I think it's, it's um, you're right. It's, it's easy to define an API, but it's not so easy to operated in a good way. This is why we have integrated it into the log management, into the monitoring system that you always can have an eye on it. And, you know, best practices definitely are that you activate a monitoring, that you have a heartbeat and you have an external system, which is calling your APIs in a specified way. Like, for example, there are tools available like Postman and other things, which ensure that the APIs, once you have deployed, are really behaving the way you have intended it. Yeah. And in these tools, what you typically use for API monitoring, you can define also, for example, test parameters to say, this is an expected response from the API, and this is how it should be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. And the last question which I, which I have in the chat is the following. Are there any Let's Encrypt HTTPS terminations or any ACME support or something like this? Also, well, as the public endpoints, when you activate the SSL for the API gateway, are working like the, the other endpoints what we have in OTC, like in the WAF. You, you can define SSL certificates, which you typically can purchase for, for example, three years, four years, five years, or you can also use it with, with Let's Encrypt, but then you have to, to deal with the limited availability or with the limited time period of these certificates, which is, for example, three months. All right. These were all questions which are in the chat and which were not already answered, so I think. You have answered all questions which are uh, popping up in this round here, Christian. So, well done. With this, thank you a lot, everybody who has joined us today in our live webinar. Also, one more time, Christian, for having this webinar here together with you for the preparation and for the great webinar itself. So, thank you a lot, everybody. Okay, great, thank Stefan. You. Also, Bye. thanks to you a lot for helping us to organize this webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.